Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Peter Perdue, a professor of history at Yale University. Professor Perdue is the author of two widely acclaimed books, Exhausting the Earth, State and Peasant in Hunan, 1500 to 1850 AD, and China Marches West, The Qing Conquest of Central Eurasia. He has also written on grain markets in China, agricultural development, and environmental history. Professor Purdue's research interests lie in modern Chinese and Japanese social and economic history, the history of frontiers, and world history. Today we'll talk with him about tea cultivation in China. Welcome, Professor Purdue. Thank you. You've written an essay entitled, Is Puar in Zomia? And it looks at the, um, some of the associations, cultural and economic associations of tea, particularly from an, uh, a historical perspective. Let's begin with defining what puar is and then what zomia is. Yes, well, puar is a kind of tea that's grown in Yunnan province in South China. Uh, and today it's a very uh, popular tea in China and has a great deal of value on the uh, tea market for connoisseurs. It can even sell for thousands of dollars uh, per ounce. Uh, Zomia is a region that was defined by the political scientist uh, Jim Scott here at Yale and some other people that includes uh, the hill lands of both northern Southeast Asia and South China, which uh, Yunnan is a part of. So the basic question in this paper is, uh, and I put in those strange words just to attract attention, really. Mm -hmm. Got my attention. <laughs> they're both new words, unfamiliar ones. But the basic idea is if there's tea cultivation in this southern region of China and also this very special quality of this hill zone, and tea is a global product, of course, what is the relationship between this kind of global trade uh, and the hill zones of uh, South China and northern Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay, given your scholarly background, how were you drawn to this particular topic? Well, my two previous books, uh, one was on Hunan, which is in central China now, but was more of a frontier zone back mm -hmm. in the 16th century. And the second book is on the conquest of uh, central Eurasia, modern Mongolia and Xinjiang. So both of my two previous books were about frontier regions of China, pretty much on the edge of the empire at the time, and how they got uh, incorporated and made part of the main empire. And in a way, the tea project is a little bit of an extension of that. Mm -hmm. It looks at a, another frontier region, South China, the hill lands, and how this particular trade route then brought in some of the people of that region into what is really a very major global trade today. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about the methodology. Are there other tea studies that you were able to draw on? How did you go about doing the research for the paper? Well, there are actually lots and lots of books about tea. There mm -hmm. are a lot of popular books, you know, um, which are all a great fun to read. Mm -hmm. And most of them focus on the British, basically. The idea of, of course, the British uh, who went to China to buy the tea in the 19th century uh, and then grew the tea in India for themselves, uh, really started the opium war in China in order to pay for the tea. So the vast majority of studies are from the British point of view. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese sources on tea itself haven't actually been looked at very much. And I think a lot of the studies of tea don't really get the entire picture of how tea is a product of China, but a global commodity at the same time. Okay, so you used some of you drew on some of the existing research, but um, how did you go about writing the paper? Did you, um, did you actually um, visit these areas, um, for instance? Well, no, I'm really at the very beginning stages of this. So okay. I certainly, I definitely want to go to Yunnan uh, mm -hmm. uh, back and see the tea regions at some point. And I've looked at published sources and libraries, but I haven't been through the archives yet to look for uh, tea-related sources. Right. Okay. Uh, and I'm just beginning to look at other secondary and primary sources on the subject now. Okay. Yeah. And I am um, curious to know about another beverage you mentioned in the essay called Mao tea, mm -hmm. or Mao Tai? Mao Tai, Mao yeah, tai. that's right. Um, what is it and how is it uh, related to tea? Well, this is, I guess, how I got interested in this subject in the first place. Um, Mao Tai is actually a, a very hard liquor, powerful liquor uh, distilled from sorghum. Mm -hmm. And sorghum is actually a plant my students don't know about 
though it looks like American corn mm -hmm. on the stalk, but it's a grain um, brewed or eaten all over China. And uh, when I first went to China in the early days of the opening of China, uh, Mao Tai was this very popular, uh, a very high-priced luxury uh, drink that they would serve you at all these Chinese banquets. Okay. And even when Nixon went to China, I believe Mao Tai was the premier drink served at the banquets to welcome him to China. It was actually made in South China, also in this frontier zone. Uh, today, if you go to China, I think it's more likely, and this is what happened to me, your friends uh, will start giving you Pu'er tea mm -hmm. instead of Mao Tai. If, they, if you tell them you like tea, they, they say, oh, have you tried Pu'er? Because this is really the highest quality kind of stuff. So why was there this switch you know, from this really powerful liquor, mm -hmm. for example, as the premier sort of banquet uh, drink to something like Pu'er? That's, that's what really got me interested in this subject in the first place. And what is it? Well, it's a cultural shift, I would say. Uh -huh. You know, the Communist Party, uh, when they came to power, before they came to power even, were in the northwest part of China, where sorghum grew and uh, cruder, rot gut versions of Mao Tai were really the main kind of liquor that the local peasants drank. And mm -hmm. they grew up on this stuff. And that's what they thought they would want to have for themselves. And when they were giving banquets and everything, they would want the highest quality of this really North Chinese uh, sorghum liquor. Um, but now the Communist Party, of course, still in power, but has changed its culture and wants to look more sophisticated, I think, and uh, be more attractive to global audiences. And tea has had all, of course, these ancient cultural associations with China. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's not so much the party now, but businessmen, <coughs> everybody, officials who promotes Chinese tea culture as kind of the essence of China today. Mm -hmm. Okay, and <coughs> what do you think the shift from the Mao Tai to the high quality tea shows? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, saw, I wish it would show that maybe <laughs> Chinese officials are getting less drunk than they used to be, <laughs> but I could not prove that okay. with uh, data at this point. <laughs> but the image that China wants to project to the world, certainly, mm -hmm. and I think even the kinds of products that Chinese people consume today have changed drastically over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. whereas they had a much simpler cuisine in certain ways under the Maoist period, it was grains, Mao Tai made from grains, it was a few vegetables, a little bit of uh, pork and chicken. Now, of course, they're consuming all sorts of different products, um, including a lot more meat mm -hmm. uh, and seafoods and rare goods. And uh, so they've always had these luxury connoisseur tastes, but mm -hmm. now a lot more Chinese are much wealthier. They're consuming the foods of the world, in fact. Uh, sure. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, the social life of tea. Um, wh what does it illustrate in terms of um, the hill country or Azomia um, in connection with urban tea houses? Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is the connection I think hasn't been made all that often, but mm -hmm. uh, tea is very famous in China as a drink for uh, scholars, uh, for uh, Literary, literary people, uh, you know, and it uh, is a stimulant to keep you awake so you can read mo longer. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was drunk in monasteries by Buddhists so they could meditate. So it always has these high-level associations with religion and uh, literary scholarship. But most of the best tea in China, everyone agrees, comes from the hills. And these are very remote and backward places, mm -hmm. very poor often. And often the t people who pick the tea are not even Chinese, they are very poor mountain people who are brought in to pick the crops. Uh, so uh -huh. I think to get the total story of tea, we do want to talk about the consumption side, but mm -hmm. if you look at the production side in the hills, then you have this link to this Zomian hill country, which has these very special kinds of peoples who are you know, quite distinct from the, the urban lowland consumers. Okay, have you, you've actually had pu'er tea? Yes, I'm actually a fan of it. Okay, I mean, I'm yeah. dying to try it now, well, having you read your try paper. So <laughs> can you describe what it tastes like? Uh, well, the, even the terms used to describe it today are quite fascinating. I, I, I would say most of my friends who try it would use terms like um, earth or tobacco or uh, other lower level terms <laughs> 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 taste like you know oh, what because okay. it's a very it is an earthy drink mm -hmm. uh, very different from the standard green tea right, 
But okay. the promoters of Pu'ar often use the wine vocabulary. You see oh, really? all these things that you see attached to, to fine French wines with the, the flavors of anise and orange and a little bit of earth and uh, sunshine. All the California French wine terminology is now applied to Pu'ar to make it look like a similar kind mm -hmm. of very sophisticated uh, product. All and marketing. It's, yeah, it's all, it's all marketing, mm -hmm. but they're mixing together this Chinese and global marketing vocabularies, okay. which makes it fascinating. Yeah. And what do you conclude in your essay? Is Pu'er in Zomia? Well, if Zomia means uh, geography, and that was the original idea, is that it's, it's a particular kind of region, a, a highland zone uh, in China, then the source of Pu'er is in Zomia. But uh, Jim Scott has other ideas about what Zomia is, that Zomia has special kinds of people in it, uh, he says there are people who avoid the state. Uh, his book on Zomia is an anarchist history of Southeast Asia. These are refuged zones, uh, shatter zones, where people go to get away from states and markets. The people producing poor, I'm not, I'm not so sure that's true. They, mm -hmm. they are actually involved in commerce, after all, even the pickers um, and the merchants and the consumers. And there are these links that connect the Zomian region to the lowlands, the rivers, the ports, and the rest of the world. So it's a, it's a link between the, the Zomian region and the rest of the world, I think. Okay. Well, I will have to try some of yeah, that. Yeah, you should try it. Soon. Yeah, see if you like it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. For more information about Professor Purdue and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.